Since it is the month of Halloween, I decided that in today's video I wanted to talk about some scenes from great books that absolutely terrified me. Now obviously with books, I don't know if you find this, but you don't often come across a scene in a book, even in a horror book, where you're really scared in the way that you might be when you watch a film. Just something about the lack of visuals, I suppose. But sometimes there are just certain scenes or certain books that you read and they just stay with you for a very long time after you've read them. Either because of something horrific and disturbing visually or because of just something psychologically creepy um, that you, you, know, you just can't get out of your head. And so these are the things that I want to talk about in this video. Some of these books are going to be straight up horror books or short stories. Some of them are just going to be scenes from books that aren't really horror at all, but they're just so creepy that I think it's, it's worth talking about them and maybe even worth reading them during the Halloween period. Before I share my list, don't forget to give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. And make sure you let me know in the comments what are some of the scariest scenes that you have ever come across in your reading experiences. First up we have Dread by Clive Barker. Dread belongs to Barker's Books of Blood series, which I would definitely recommend reading during the Halloween period. It is chocked full of terrifying stories, sometimes funny stories, sometimes very gothic, sometimes very modern. Pretty much any kind of horror story Barker does in this collection, which is six volumes long, so there's quite, quite a lot of short stories to get through. But to me, Dread is one of the best, and it's one of the horror stories that really stuck with me long after I finished the story. Dread tells the story of Steve, who is a young philosophy student, who meets this mature uh, student called Quaid, who is very enigmatic, and he has a very strange philosophy of fear, and in particular, he has a very strange philosophy of, of dread, and the nature of dread. And this causes Quaid to do some, uh, let's say, pretty terrifying experiments on some of the students. Now, I won't tell you what those experiments uh, entail, because it would kind of spoil the, uh, the fun of that story, but let's just say that it's a story that really gets under your skin. It plays with your deep anxieties and fears. And in fact, the only thing that I can think of that reminds me of a little bit is the ending of 1984 when you have the whole Room 101. That kind of, you know, room that has your darkest fear and that's what is unleashed. Quaid sort of reminds me of, <laughs> of what goes on at the end of that book. There is no delight the equal of dread. If it were possible to sit, invisible, between two people on any train, in any waiting room or office, the conversation overheard would time and again circle on that subject. Certainly, the debate might appear to be about something else entirely different, the state of the nation, idle chat about death on the roads, the rising price of dental care, but strip away the metaphor, the innuendo, and there, nestling at the heart of the discourse, is dread. While the nature of God and the possibility of eternal life go undiscussed, we happily chew over the minutiae of misery. The syndrome recognises no boundaries. In bathhouse and seminar room alike, the same ritual is repeated. With the inevitability of a tongue returning to probe a painful tooth, we come back and back and back again to our fears, sitting to talk them over with the eagerness of a hungry man before a full and steaming plate. So that's the opening paragraph there of Dread. I think it's a great opening paragraph. It just sets the kind of, you know, the general kind of metaphor or the theme of the short story, this idea of dread as something that we always return to that's beneath all of our conversations and beneath all of uh, polite society. It's a great uh, introduction to a very effective short horror story. Next up we have Dante's Inferno, and in particular I'm thinking of the seventh circle of hell, which contains the harpies and the suicides. Now there's a lot of terrifying uh, punishments and gore and horror in Dante's Inferno. This is where souls who are going, this is where the souls who've done wrong go to hell. So it's a pretty terrifying place. But I think that at least to kind of modern sensibilities, the seventh circle where the suicidal people end up, uh, this to me seems to be the scariest or, or the most disturbing, mainly because our views on suicide have changed significantly from Dante's time. And so the punishment here feels incredibly harsh and brutal in a way that some of the other punishments, because they feel more just, don't. So Virgil and Dante arrive in this circle and they find themselves in a forest and there are harpies in this place and these harpies swoop down and feed on these trees. And I believe Dante breaks a branch off of one of these trees and suddenly hears the sounds of someone moaning and he realizes that this is someone inside the tree. And what he learns from this tree is that 
he and the other trees are actually people and they are inside these trees and these are people who have uh, committed suicide. Now all of Dante's punishments uh, use this idea of divine justice and the idea behind the punishments in hell is that they're meant to match the crime that you did in life. And so for the suicides, uh, they are trapped in these trees, these are their new bodies, and they're fed off of by these harpies, so quite painful, uh, and they can't speak unless the, they're wounded. So that's why when Dante breaks the branch, this tree can speak to him. But even worse than this is that when the Day of Judgment comes, they will have to go and reclaim their bodies uh, at, on the Day of Judgment and then drag them back down into hell and hang them from these trees and never be able to inhabit them again, but the body will always be there. Obviously the idea here is that they rejected their body and therefore they will have to just kind of live with it there but never be able to make use of it again. So a terrifying image uh, and just a terrifying idea of an eternal punishment for someone who you know may have not had the best of lives that's why they may have committed suicide so that's what I mean it's it feels much harsher it feels much more brutal and it's a scene that just completely uh, took me by surprise when I read it it was shocking and it's an image that just stayed with me long after uh, I finished that passage also William Blake did some terrifying uh, but also wonderful illustrations of this scene and also the other scenes in the inferno which I think are just uh, fantastic illustrations and the edition of the book that I have has these illustrations and it just adds to the, uh, you know, the colour and richness of Dante's world. The passage that I'm going to read out is the response or the tree's response to Dante when Dante asks the tree how his soul is trapped there and whether or not it can ever be freed from its fate. Tell us in what way the soul is bound within these knots and tell us if thou canst, if any from such members air is freed. Then blew the trunk amain and afterward the wind was into such a voice converted. With brevity shall be replied to you, when the exasperated soul abandons the body whence it rent itself away, Minos consigns it to the seventh abyss. It falls into the forest, and no part is chosen for it, but where fortune hurls it, there like a grain of spelt it germinates. It springs a sapling, and a forest tree, the harpies, feeding then upon its leaves, do pain create, and for the pain an outlet. Like others for our spoils shall we return, but not that any one may them revest, for tis not just to have what one casts off. Here we shall drag them, and along the dismal forest our bodies shall suspended be, each to the thorn of his molested shade. Next we have what I call the monastery scene from Justine by the Marquis de Sade. Now, Justine is an interesting novel because on the one hand, and this is kind of true of most of Sard, is that there are elements of the Gothic in what he does. You have these huge sprawling castles with dungeons, with terrible uh, things occurring, more terrible than you usually find in Gothic novels, and that's saying something. But on the other hand, you have uh, comedy, you have satire, and sometimes things that are just so disgusting and ridiculous that you can't do anything but either retch or, or laugh, uh, and that's about it. But there are certain bits of Sard that are just absolutely terrifying. But the one that I always come back to and the one that really first uh, grabbed me uh, was a scene that is, I think is just in the middle of Justine, uh, where Justine, who is a virtuous heroine who wants to do right, she believes in God, she's virtuous, she's wonderful, uh, is in a world in which that doesn't serve you very well and people constantly do terrible things to her. Uh, she is caught, she's kidnapped, abused in all kinds of ways but she always escapes but unfortunately she's just also very trusting and so she usually ends up going straight into uh, even even worse situations now halfway through the book she comes across arguably the worst group of people that she meets in this entire book which is saying something and these are a, a contingent of monks who live in this isolated monastery and they essentially keep uh, uh, female slaves um, and make them do all kinds of horrific things for them, uh, essentially, like I say, slaves. And she learns going in that they, sometimes women are there for a very long time, sometimes women are there for a very short period of time, but at some point they will be released into the wild. <laughs> uh, and it's kind of implied that they actually do get to go at, at some point, um, or at least it's a mystery as, as to what happens to them. Now, Justine, uh, she has a friend called, I think, Umphail, um, um, and 
And Fail is one of the women who leaves while Justine is there. So she goes and later on Justine decides that she has to escape. And so she concocts a plan uh, and she is going to escape and she is on her way out and she finds out what happens to the women who they who are supposed to be uh, leaving and it's just it's just such a, i don't know why it just terrifies me as a scene she's going through the dungeon she, she's almost free and then she discovers this and obviously she thinks of her friend who uh, helped her is probably one of you know one of these women who, who have, have, have now died and been killed by these monks and so i will read for you this particular scene having failed so far to find an opening in the hedge I resolved to make one. Without anyone noticing, I had equipped myself with a long knife. I set about working with it. Despite the gloves I was wearing, my hands were soon covered in cuts, but nothing stopped me. The hedge was more than two feet thick, but I managed to open it sufficiently to reach the second enclosure. There, I was astonished to feel the earth to be soft, giving way beneath my feet, and I sank into it up to my ankles. The further I advanced through these dense corpses, the darker they became. Curious to know the reason for this change in terrain, I felt with my hands. Heaven, I was holding a skull. Dear God, I thought in horror. This is doubtless the cemetery where these torturers throw the bodies of their victims, just as I had been told. They scarcely take the trouble to cover them with earth. This skull was perhaps that of my dear Omphail, or of the unfortunate Octavi, so beautiful, so sweet, so good and who appeared on earth like the rose, of whose loveliness she was the very image. Alas, that would have been my fate too. Why not simply submit to it? What would I gain from leaving, only to find new setbacks? Have I not committed enough crimes here? Have I not here become the cause of enough crimes? Oh, let me fulfil my destiny. Oh, earth, open up and swallow me. When one is as forsaken, as poor, as abandoned as I, why should one make such efforts to lead such pointless existence any longer in the company of such monsters? No, no, I must avenge virtue in chains. She expects me to have the courage to do so. I should not allow myself to be cowed. I must go forward. It is essential that the world be rid of villains as dangerous as these. Must I fear causing the loss of a handful of men's lives in order to save those of millions of individuals sacrificed to their savagery or their philosophy? And so I cut through the hedge at the place where I was. What I like about that passage is that not only do you have the revelations as Justine is going through the cellar, seeing that there is more to this place than she thought, then discovering the bodies or the skeletons of those victims, she then has this crisis, this moral crisis, where she's thinking, why am I doing this? Why don't I just let myself go uh, either you know either go over to evil or just die here with them and she comes through it and says no i'm going to fight uh, i'm going to carry on despite the fact i have no reason to think i'm going to have any more success and what's interesting about that to me is, is as a scene is that it shows that justine although she is a victim throughout the book she is actually very strong uh, she has resolution she has these principles and she's always able to fight back and one of the things that Sard says in the opening, which who knows if he meant this because he might have just been saying this to hedge his bets, was that he was trying with this book to show why it's always good to be virtuous, even in the face of overwhelming odds. And that's what Justine is. So not only is this scene terrifying, it's also quite uh, affirming as well. Okay, next is a gothic classic, which I'm sure everyone will know, uh, and this is Dracula. And in particular, the scene or the opening chapter uh, where Jonathan Harker goes to Castle Dracula to stay with Dracula uh, and I just think that this whole opening chapter is a master uh, work in tension. Every single diary entry that Jonathan has in this opening part just adds a new layer of tension. You have the opening chapter where he arrives up to the castle which is the bit that I'm going to read out and that ends in a very foreboding kind of way with him arriving and the castle is there and it's just a shadow, a cragged shadow and he's slightly scared to say the least. And then at the end of the next chapter, you have him learning something uh, about the count, count, something's not quite right. And then I think the next one is when he meets the brides and you have the big revelation that they, uh, are not only that they're vampires, but he watches them uh, devour a baby, uh, which you know, pretty terrifying stuff. 
uh, and then at the end of the final uh, chapter in this part of the book, he is abandoned to his fate in Castle Dracula. And then we move to the to the main part of the story with Mina and everyone. And we're just left hanging with, with Jonathan's fate. We have no idea what happened to him for a while. So I just think this is a wonderful uh, uh, exercise in, in, like I say, intention building, the way that Stoker builds all of that up. I think, to be honest, you could just re read that and take that and it would just be a perfect short gothic horror story on its own. Although, of course, the rest of uh, Dracula is fantastic as well. Just a little bit of context, though, before I do that. As just before this uh, scene occurs, Jonathan has been becoming more and more afraid as he's journeying towards the castle. His driver is a very peculiar person who doesn't speak, who is incredibly creepy. Uh, there are wolves howling, and it seems like they are like coming up to the carriage, uh, and Jonathan thinks he might be eaten by these wolves. The person in the carriage doesn't seem to, to care about this. The carriage keeps stopping in weird places, and obviously that makes Jonathan even more afraid. And we arrive at the castle, suddenly the wolves fall silent, and that's when Jonathan sees the castle for the first time. When I could see again, the driver was climbing into the caliche, and the wolves had disappeared. This was all so strange and uncanny that a dreadful fear came upon me, and I was afraid to speak or move. The time seemed interminable as we swept on our way, now in almost complete darkness, for the rolling clouds obscured the moon. We kept on ascending, with occasional periods of quick descent, but in the main, always ascending. Suddenly, I became conscious of the fact that the driver was in the act of pulling up the horses in the courtyard of a vast, ruined castle, from whose tall, black windows came no ray of light, and whose broken battlements showed a jagged line against the moonlit sky. You just know, reading that, that nothing good is going to come of this visit to Castle Dracula. Moving ahead now in time, we have Shirley Jackson's famous short story, The Lottery. Now this is a hard one to summarize in a way that doesn't really kind of, you know, you don't want to spoil the story too much. And even reading some of this <laughs> kind of might spoil it. So I, I picked a passage that I think is reasonably ambiguous, uh, but let's just say that the, the lottery uh, tells the story of a village that have a ritual that they uh, take part in every year called the lottery. Uh, and they, they do this without fail and if you win the lottery, you really don't want to don't really don't want to win this lottery. Um, it, it's pretty dark what happens, uh, and it's hard to say. Like you know, kind of hard to reveal any more than that. But again, it's just one of those uh, one of those short stories where it begins in a kind of innocuous way. It's not obvious what's going on, and then slowly she just unravels what this lottery is, and slowly the winner of the lottery is revealed, and we see how the village reacts to this. Uh, and the, the way that they react is terrifying. It's a good uh, kind of, I guess, critique or understanding of how mob mentality uh, works perhaps or something like that. But yeah, it's just a terrifying uh, reveal, slow reveal. And I'm surprised that according to Wikipedia anyway, this story did not get very good reviews uh, when it was initially, uh, when it initially came about. I think people just maybe found it too shocking, uh, but I think it is a, a fantastic uh, short story and one that really, you know, you just remember it when it finishes. The lottery was conducted, as were the square dances, the teen club, the Halloween programme, by Mr Summers, who had time and energy to devote to civic activities. He was a round-faced, jovial man, and ran the coal business, and people were sorry for him because he had no children and his wife was a scold. When he arrived in the square, carrying the black wooden box, there was a murmur of conversation among the villagers, and he waved and called, Little late today, folks! The postmaster, Mr Graves, followed him, carrying a three-legged stool, and the stool was put in the centre of the square, and Mr. Summer set the black box down upon it. The villagers kept their distance, leaving a space between themselves and the stool, and when Mr. Summers said, Some of you fellows want to give me a hand? There was a hesitation before two men, Mr. Martin and his oldest son, Baxter, came forward to hold the box steady on the stool, while Mr. Summer stirred up the papers inside it. So obviously that passage is not particularly uh, revealing, uh, for good reason. It's just seemingly, like I said, innocuous. You have them, you know, gathering together and setting up uh, for this lottery. And you have the introduction of this character, Mr. Summers, who we hear, you know, he runs the square dances and the Halloween stuff and all this. And so, you know, it seems like a very nice guy who does community things and everything seems completely normal. But then as you go through the story and you learn what the lottery is, 
and what he's doing and who wins the lottery, it just becomes absolutely terrifying. And the reaction of these villagers to this whole thing is disturbing, uh, to say the least. Now we're moving back again to some classic gothic horror with Matthew Gregory Lewis's The Mon Monk, and I am thinking specifically here of the final scene of this story, uh, which I've called Carrion for the Crows. Now I'm going to spoil the ending of this story, although I don't think it's the kind of story where spoiling it really matters. So if you, if you don't like spoilers, uh, maybe you want, to, you want to skip this one. But what I like about the ending of The Monk is that you have this the titular monk, Ambrosio, who is corrupted throughout the story. His corruption begins uh, really when he meets this uh, figure who initially seems to be an altar boy who he kind of fancies but then reveals uh, himself to be a woman uh, and I mean there's already some interesting stuff going on there and Ambrosio is tempted by this woman into evil uh, and some terrible things happen murder incest all kinds of you know those typical uh, gothic horror melodramatic things that happen and at the end of the story this um, figure that he has fallen for I think she's called Matilda um, she reveals herself to be uh, the devil and this was a kind of test for Ambrosio and he has clearly failed the test because he is evil <laughs> so then we get him taken up into the skies and dropped uh, down from, from, from great heights and we get this disturbing horrific scene of him being eaten uh, half alive on, on the ground and obviously he's going to go to hell after this uh, it's just an example of absolute brutality and what I like about this scene is that I think it really foreshadows where gothic horror especially would go because although Matthew Gregory Lewis didn't invent the gothic genre that really was Anne Radcliffe um, she, or, or, or at least she's one of the kind of founding uh, mothers of the genre but with Radcliffe the gothic is much more about what is unsaid it's about what she would call terror rather than horror which is more visual and visceral but it seems like Lewis has a lot more in common with modern horror where things are a lot more visual, especially in you know film, it's always about the blood and guts. And even in writing, it's often more about the blood and guts than the psychological underlying terror stuff. As the demon said this, darting his talons into the monk's shaven crown, he sprang with him from the rock. The caves and mountains rang with Ambrosio's shrieks. The demon continued to soar aloft, till reaching a dreadful height, he released the sufferer. Headlong fell the monk through the airy waste. The sharp point of a rock received him, and he rolled from precipice to precipice, till bruised and mangled he rested on the river's banks. Life still existed in his miserable frame. He attempted in vain to raise himself. His broken and dislocated limbs refused to perform their office, nor was he able to quit the spot where he had first fallen. The sun now rose above the horizon. Its scorching beams darted full upon the head of the expiring sinner. Myriads of insects were called forth by the warmth. They drank the blood which trickled from Ambrosio's wounds. He had no power to drive them from him, and they fastened upon his sores, darted their stings into his body, covered him with their multitudes, and inflicted on him tortures the most exquisite and insupportable. The eagles of the rock tore his flesh piecemeal and dug out his eyeballs with their crooked beaks. A burning thirst tormented him, he heard the river's murmur as it rolled beside him, but strove in vain to drag himself towards the sound. Blind, maimed, helpless and despairing, venting his rage in blasphemy and curses, execrating his existence, yet dreading the arrival of death destined to yield him up to greater torments, six miserable days did the villain languish. On the seventh, a violent storm arose. The winds in fury rent up rocks and forests, the sky was now black with clouds, now sheeted with fire. The rain fell in torrents. It swelled the stream. The waves overflowed their banks. They reached the spot where Ambrosio lay, and when they abated, carried with them into the river the course of the despairing monk. So there you have it. Six terrifying scenes from across uh, the literary canon. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books, what do you think of these particular scenes? What are some of your favourite uh, terrifying scenes from books? They need not be horror books, not all of these were horror in a traditional sense, although a lot of them were. What are the scenes that really stayed with you and what do you always read around Halloween time? Don't forget to like this video as well if you enjoyed it. Otherwise, take care everyone. Ta-ra!